never claim anything for mine. I don't necessarily claim it for mine. It's ours. Ours. That's why I made a fancy public release. Oh, I know. been watching it, but I'm curious. Are we ready, Jeremy? Thank you all for being here today. Delighted to have the opportunity to hear from members of our lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer community has made important contributions to our country and society, but individuals often have had to hide their true selves or risk being the target of discrimination, harassment, or worse. Because people felt the need to use euphemisms to describe themselves, their relationships, and their lives, it can be hard to identify and share LGBTQ history. Despite recent gains in rights and in recognition, the reality is that members of the LGBTQ community still face significant barriers to access to, access, to representation and to how we share and interpret LGBTQ history. Although the National Park Service is often called America's Storyteller, LGBTQ sites represent less than 0.1% of the 2,500 National Historic Landmarks and only 0.005% of the over 90,000 sites on the National Register of Historic Places, making it painfully clear that not all of America's stories are equally uh, represented. America's public lands and waters belong to all Americans, and it's critical that these protected places are inclusive and representative of the diversity of the American experience, especially at a time when this administration has repeatedly deprioritized or reversed efforts to increase the rights and representation of all people. From its opposition to flying the first permanent pride flag at the Stonewall National Monument, to its efforts to ban transgender people from serving in the military, to removing health care protections against discrimination based on gender or sexual orientation, this administration has continuously worked to undermine the rights of the LGBTQ community. It's clear that this administration needs to be re reminded that America's public lands must be accessible and welcoming to all. These treasured places preserve the diverse history and culture of our nation, and this committee is committed to ensuring that our public lands are inclusive and representative of all visitors, that our federal workforce represents the diversity of our nation, and that all com communities can access and enjoy the outdoors. As some of you may be aware, this committee has prioritized these democratic forums focused on speaking up for the communities who too often have been marginalized or disrespected historically and more recently by this administration. Today, we want to hear from you all about how we can elevate your voices and ensure that our public lands represent and can be enjoyed by all Americans. I would like to thank the panelists again for taking the time to be here today and for sharing their stories and insights with the committee. I look forward to working with you all in the future. And now I would like to introduce our panel. Laura Esquivel is now with Hispanic Federation, but was Senior Vice President of the Gay and Lesbian Victory Fund and Gay and Lesbian Leadership Institute. And maybe I'll just introduce all of you first and then you can t give your testimonies. Sue Ferentinos wrote, Interpreting LGBTQ History at Museums and Historic Sites. Chad Lord is currently with the National Parks Conservation Association and was fundamental to the Stonewall designation. Elise Rylander is the founder and executive director of Out There Adventures, an adventure education organization 
committed to building community for LGBTQ young people through professionally facilitated experiential education activities. We're so happy to have all of you here. Thank you for coming. And um, Ms. Esquivel, you may be begin your testimony. Oh, is that better? There we go. If I start over, does my time start over? Or should I just keep going? Just keep going. Okay, great. Uh, so they provide science-based estimates and reports every five years about the volume and characteristics of recreation visits to the National Forest Service or National Park and Wildlife Areas, areas where hiking, backpacking, and camping predominate. NPS found that in the five-year period that ended in 2016, out of nearly 147 million recreation visits to national forests, 35% of visitors had household incomes of over $100,000. Only 27% had household incomes under $50,000. They also found that almost 90% of visitors during that period were white. For example, during that period, African Americans accounted for 1.2% of all visits. American Indian, Native Alaskans, only 2.1%. Latinos accounted for 6%. Why am I talking about race and income as a, on a panel about LGBT people and barriers to accessing national parks? Well, in spite of prevailing perceptions about typical LGBT communities fueled by advertising and popular culture, not only are some LGBT people poor, in fact, after controlling for a number of factors associated with poverty, poverty rates for LGBT adults are higher than for heterosexual adults, and they're significantly higher for subpopulations such as racial minorities and transgender people. That fact should not be surprising, but it is to many. After all, LGBT people are born into all kinds of families and face the same socioeconomic challenges. But they also face unique obstacles because of their sexual orientation and gender identity. Those include a higher risk of being homeless when they're young, harassment and discrimination at school and at the workplace, and until very recently being denied the economic benefits of marriage. We are not all Will of Will and Grace, Cameron and Mitchell and Modern Family, and there is only one Alan, sadly. To envision the LGBT poor, you only have to think about the young gay man or lesbian kicked out of their home who ends up at the Greyhound bus station in Hollywood, the transgender woman being turned down in every entry level job or interview. 24% of lesbians are poor, compared to only 19% of heterosexual women, and African American same sex couples are roughly three times more likely to live in poverty than white same sex couples. According to the Williams Institute, transgender people are four times as likely to have a household income under $10,000 and be unemployed at four times the national average. 90% of LGBT people say they've experienced harassment, mistreatment, or discrimination on the job, and almost one in five reported being homeless at some point in their life. In theory, camping should be a very inexpensive activity since you are literally sleeping on the ground. But you may need to fly to your destination, otherwise you'll need a car and a full tank of gas. A backpack tent and necessary gear and supplies could easily run you $1,000 or more. And then you need some free time, which you probably don't have because low-income people ironically work more hours frequently in multiple jobs than higher-income people. Add to this that according to a 2013 Pew survey of LGBT Americans, about 30% of us say we've been physically attacked or threatened, and about 58% of us say we've been the target of slurs or jokes. Gay bashing is real even today, as out as I am. I think twice about holding the hand of my partner of nearly 16 years in public, depending on where we are, something my straight counterparts never stop to think about. I'm not sure I would feel comfortable, much less safe, being identified as lesbians at a campsite populated by predominantly heterosexual individuals or families, much less on an isolated trail. Many of us have heard the infamous stories of lesbian couples targeted and killed while hiking the Appalachian Trail. One couple in their mid-twenties had their hands bound and their throats slit and their killer was never caught. Another couple was shot by a man who said he was enraged by seeing them be affectionate. Not to be overly dramatic, but safety is definitely a concern. 
So those are some of the barriers. NPS and other public lands agencies have struggled to bring in visitors with diverse socioeconomic backgrounds. Lack of diversity is reflected in the workforce with nearly 80% of NPS employees being white. I don't think there's any information on how many are openly LGBT. Add to that a history of exclusion and discrimination and heritage reflected or rather not reflected in our parks. Lack of economic resources plus safety concerns. Well, those are a lot of barriers. For LGBT people, women, and minorities, we must do better to create welcoming spaces and safe environments. Homophobia, transphobia, and misogyny are infections throughout our public body. But it's not just the question of representation, it's also about making the idea of conservation and protecting our natural resources relevant to more diverse groups of Americans. And that means protecting lands and creating monuments that speak to the cultural values and history of the groups, diverse groups of this country. Such connections are critical in the cultivation of a conservation ethic and sense of stewardship among diverse Americans. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ms. Ferentinos. As a member of the LGBTQ community and as a professional historian, I'd like to thank you for hosting this forum today and for including history as part of the conversation. As the members of the subcommittee already know, many of America's most treasured historic sites reside on federal land. These sites in the aggregate strive to preserve tangible evidence of the American past, to create a narrative about who we, as a nation, came to be who we are. But until quite recently, LGBTQ history has been excluded from that story. And that is a real shame, because without the stories of LGBTQ people who lived before us, we aren't telling an accurate story. LGBTQ history must be part of the US historical narrative, because LGBTQ people have always been a part of that history. If we, as a people, don't share the stories of the LGBTQ past, we, as a people, are censoring history. We're sending the message that LGBTQ people don't matter and that their lives are not worthy of remembrance. In contrast, think what could happen if the federal government consistently stuck to the message that LGBTQ people are legitimate members of this nation and its heritage. Over time, we could change society and reduce the prejudice that currently constrains LGBTQ lives. There are young people in this country who are struggling with the realization that they identify as LGBTQ. They're facing the fear and often the reality that by embracing this part of their identity, they'll lose other parts, their religious community, maybe, or their families of origin, or their hometowns. Think how powerful it would be for those young people to find their LGBTQ ancestors and see them celebrate it for their contributions to this country. They discover that they, too, can be part of history. But to make the queer past accessible to everyone, a few things do need to fall into place. LGBTQ people need to feel safe and welcome on public lands. And we can make progress in this direction by training staff in cultural competency. The government needs to actually know about the LGBTQ related history that occurred at places that are now public historic sites so that we can share these stories with visitors. And for that, we need to fund additional research. I'd also urge the government to seek a balance between showcasing resources that are specifically relevant to LGBTQ history and integrating LGBTQ voices and experiences at sites that tell a larger American story. By doing both, we can highlight the specific contributions LGBTQ communities have made to American history 
while also reaching audiences who wouldn't necessarily seek out a specifically queer historic site. Taking both approaches can help reach the widest possible audience and send the very clear message that LGBTQ history is American history. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Lord. Thank you. My name is Chad Lord and I work for the National Parks Conservation Association. It's nice to be with you today. MPCA was formed 100 years ago to be the citizen voice for the new network of public lands being set aside for our nation's enjoyment. We have pursued our mission to preserve and protect national parks for future generations from the very beginning. MPCA has grown in its 100 years. We've moved over time beyond just focusing on parks that protect large landscapes, increasing our advocacy for sites that protect our shared American story. For us, our American network of special places, which we set aside, must reflect Americans of color, with women, Latinos, and people like me. I'm a gay man who loves to go to our national parks with, our fa with my family. We like road trips and have visited a lot of national park sites across the country. If your experience at a national park is like mine, then you've experienced the National Park Service as America's storyteller. There is something special about the way a park ranger can capture the essence of our country, explaining grand landscapes and uni unique geology, our most inspiring people and important events. Yet even though with all our travels, before 2016, something was just not there. In all our visits, my husband, daughter, and I would see other Americans memorialized, but the faces of people like me were missing. The people and places associated with my community were absent from our national narrative. And my husband and I began to really feel its absence as we began thinking about how our daughter would not see her family's story protected by our parks and public lands. The stories of L lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer identified Americans were ignored in what we chose and what was being chosen to, to protect, preserve, and represent in our public system and our system of public lands. And until June 2016, there was not one national park site the American people set aside to tell the LGBTQ story. And of course, that changed when President Obama created the Stonewall National Monument. So why did we start with Stonewall? Because Stonewall is an important touchstone in the fight for LGBTQ rights. Before Stonewall, we lived in the closet out of fear. There was no out, there was just in. But in the 60s, things were changing. The African American Civil Rights Movement was fighting against Jim Crow and discrimination. The anti-war movement was showing people how to protest and resist. The beginnings of our movement had already begun. In 1965, the Mattachine Society picketed at the White House and with the Daughters of Belitis later marched at Independence Hall. The first known instance of collective LGBTQ resistance to police harassment took place at Compton's Cafeteria in San Francisco in August 1966. And following a violent police raid on New Year's Eve in 1966, protesters stood in front of LA's Black Cat, demi demanding an end to police intimidation, humiliation, and brutality. Stonewall, however, marks a turning point. This dirty, expensive, mafia-run bar opened in 1967, and it became a popular spot, a gay spot in New York City. It was the only club featuring unfettered dancing for its patrons with two dance floors and a good jukebox. It was, the, it was only a matter of time before something exploded and something did on June 28, 1969. For the second time that week, a group of police showed up at the bar. This time, instead of watching LGBTQ people walk away, the police faced an enraged crowd. The homeless gay youth and the trans women were some of the first to resist and their actions inspired the crowd which turned on police who retreated into the club to save themselves. Riot police were called in and the blocks around Stonewall, uh, the blocks around the Stonewall Inn were fought over for six nights. The intensity and scale of resistance was unprecedented and shocked LGBTQ people and our allies. What happened was powerful. It was unexpected. It was unplanned. The police were astonished by what they had witnessed. The world has become astonished at its consequences. We had stood up for ourselves and won, and less than a year later, New York's LGBTQ people would vote to annually celebrate what had happened. Pride marches and festivals first celebrated in New York surged across the country and now around the world. 
So a movement started in rebellion has stayed alive, much of which in that very spirit. There is a lot to learn about what happened on that Greenwich Village block 50 years ago. The story of Stonewall raises challenging questions that confront us as we think about the obvious progress we've made, how the discrimination before Stonewall can be reconciled with the progress that came after and the struggles that still exist. The creation of the Stonewall National Monument is a significant sign of how far we come. Its addition to the national park system added a new voice to the, quote, cumulative expression of a single national heritage, unquote, that the Park Service protects. But it's a voice. There are many more out there deserving to be heard. Not every place will become a national park site. But the National Park Service, for, however, can and is helping communities across the country expand what is protected and preserved, helping to tell the many untold stories that are too often overlooked. The Park Service, through its programs and theme studies, is ideally situated to help with integrating our stories, not only in communities across America, but where appropriate, at new and existing places on our public lands and not just stories about civil rights heroes like those at Stonewall, but the doctors, scientists, politicians, factory workers, and the many others that have helped shape our cities, states, and nation. The Park Service needs the continuing support to help it address this backlog of work. I wanna thank the committee for holding this forum today and for elevating our stories and, in, about, and tr talking to us about increasing representation on our public lands. I am truly honored to be part of this conversation and look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. And our last witness, Elise Rylander. Thank you to the committee um, for having me here. It's a pleasure to be with you as, as well as my fellow panelists. Um, something that is a negative about going last is it's hard to come up with novel things to say. Uh, but one of the perspectives that I do hope to bring um, is that of the LGBTQ young folk that I get the pleasure of working with. So for about the last eight years, um, I have, through my nonprofit Out There Adventures, been seeking to increase opportunities and amplify the voices of queer young folks and their connection to the outdoors. So I wanted to take my time to talk about um, two stories of, of two young folks who have come through our program. The first is of Xander McRae. Um, he, I met Xander when he was 17 and uh, at an outreach event that we were doing the first summer that our nonprofit was running programs. Um, and he had always wanted to go on an, an outdoor experience. Um, he was thinking about Outward Bound, but had self-selected out uh, because of his trans identity and he wasn't sure if he would be able to fit in um, into those spaces. And so when we came offering an eight day sea kayaking trip in the San Juan Islands, he jumped at the opportunity. So I was able to spend um, those eight days with Xander and a couple of other students and share in not only wonderful experiences in building community um, and furthering resilience, but also cultivating their, their outdoor skills, as well as many other fantastic opportunities um, that are unique to the trans community, such as helping Xander administer his first shot of testosterone out of the doctor's office, um, which for folks who may not be familiar is a pretty monumental experience for any trans person and uh, especially for a trans teenager. Um, so it was, it was fantastic to be able to, to share that experience with him. We then sent Xander um, to Australia for a three-week sea kayaking course at the National Outdoor Leadership School, and he's now pursuing a career in outdoor education. Um, the second story I wanted to share was that of Mel Hanby. Um, much like Xander, Mel had often wanted to seek a career in the conservation uh, field, but had often felt as that his trans identity would be a barrier to him doing so. Um, so he came across our first ever collaboration with Northwest Youth Corps, um, in which we implemented, the, the, to the best of our knowledge, the first ever LGBTQ teen conservation corps in the country. Um, and that course spent five weeks in Washington conducting all sorts of amazing conservation work um, across Western and, and Central Washington. And I'm pleased to say that now, um, Mel is occupying the first ever LGBTQ intern position with that conservation corps. So he's been out all summer supporting our now two teen conservation corps that are working in Oregon and Washington. Um, and the hope is that Mel will be able to continue to pursue his career in conservation. So I bring up these two stories not only because I'm immensely proud of these young men and the fact that I was able to spend time with them, but because I think that these, ex these stories exemplify the barriers that uh, my fellow panelists did a fantastic job of identifying, right? And the opportunities and the um, significance that can also uh, come into play as we search for equitable representation and avenues for the queer community to, to connect with nature. 
Um, and with queer young folks, all of the barriers that my pan fellow panelists identified exist, but are, are augmented, right? Mainly because they are lacking the autonomy um, and potentially also the support at home that is necessary to seek these, these different opportunities and avenues. And while organizations like mine and our partners are doing our best to mitigate these barriers, the harsh reality is that until a queer teen turns 18 or sometimes older, their, pa their parents may simply not support them. And so this is why it is so critical to see representation of queer stories and histories in our national parks, historical sites, and monuments. And while the designation of queer spaces, queer specific spaces I should say, is one great step, we must also do better jobs to infuse these stories across um, all of our different spaces that are represented by the National Park Service in this committee. From, so from San Francisco to New York, from Omaha to Anchorage, we must strive towards true equity by utilizing our interpretation to exemplify all places, all of the places of diversity that exist in our country. And to the committee's point on um, rep or how we can build opportunities for LGBTQ young folks, um, in this work that I have been doing for the last 15 years, I've seen many well-intended initiatives fall short um, because there is, a, I think, a propensity to want to reinvent a wheel um, instead of taking the time to figure out what has already existed and what groups have been doing the work on the ground for often extended periods of time. Um, so to that end, one of my suggestions for the panel's question around boosting representation would be to first take the time, as has been highlighted by some of the panelists, to understand the history that has existed and the folks that have been doing this work on the ground um, and the young people whose stories do exist and are out there and need to be amplified. And then the second component of that would be to do the work to build relationships with those individuals at the grassroots level um, so that we can from that, uh, those relationships continue to build out creative strategies and, and continue to uncover um, what are the true barriers and, and ways to create more opportunities and access for these folks. Um, so my hope is that through this further br bridge building and between the work of the organizations represented here as well as the many others that are not um, and entities like this committee, that we can work towards a change narrative where the future Mel's and Xander's don't have to happen upon an identity specific program to find themselves, right? But rather that they can experience the magical moment of the visibility of themselves when they are in Yosemite, they're visiting the state capitol building in Kansas, or they're in downtown Seattle. Thank you for your time. Thank you all so much for your testimony. Um, I'd like to recognize my sister colleague, Sharice Davids from Kansas, uh, who is joining us on the dais today. And now I would like to recognize uh, Chairman Grijalva for a statement or questions. Thank or you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you for the, uh, the forum today, very important. Uh, and important in the sense that I think uh, with the opportunity that we have uh, on the committee to, uh, to look at our jurisdiction, our public lands, our parks, and uh, all the contents within that jurisdiction. Obviously, one of the things that, that has to be not only looked at, but also uh, requires policy development. It requires uh, actions on the part of the committee and, and under, under the leadership of uh, Ms. Holland. Uh, that's, that's to be surely anticipated in, in, in her subcommittee with public lands. I mention that because uh, we want to extend, uh, extend inclusiveness, diversity, those values, and extend them so that they're reflected fully in the public assets of the station, which is their, in this instance, their parks and their public lands. But there's other instances as well. You know, uh, steps that we can take to do that are, are many, and, and, and your guidance and your, your advice is, is, is going to be very important to us as, as going forward. Uh, Harvey Milk's camera shop, that should be a designation. Mm -hmm. Compton's cafeteria that was mentioned, the black cat that was mentioned, uh, and, and uh, other sites of historical significance. And then I think the, the point that our panelists made about also the inclusiveness of that, integrating that, the history of the uh, community fully into the history of the nation and not always having a carve out for that particular 
uh, piece of it. And I think uh, I, th I think that was an important point that was made. And uh, you know, the, I think the American people uh, can can gain significant benefit from bearing witnesses to what the LGBTQ community has gone through in terms of struggles, to their victories, and to uh, the contributions that have been made by the community to this nation of ours. And future generations can learn from it, and, uh, and what it means to, to, uh, to deal with the tough issues of hatred and intolerance that uh, have to be overcome, especially when it comes from your own government. And uh, so I want to thank the panelists for being here and, and providing that for us. You know, I, uh, you know, our country and sometimes the policy directing our, our public lands and parks has, uh, has a bad habit of favoring certain stories and over others. And this administration has turned that bad habit, in, in, uh, unfortunately, into official policy that uh, when the president spends his time demeaning, dehumanizing, suppressing, attacking vulnerable communities, vulnerable individuals, and families. Uh, I think uh, for us on the committee, it becomes even more critical, even more critical to share those stories. Uh, we, have, uh, we have a responsibility to tell the stories and to listen to them, and these uh, stories are a unifier for this nation, not a divider. And, uh, whether the administration wants to admit it or not, the stories and legacy of the LGBTQ community are a direct reflection of us and of America and its values. And I, I think that's the point uh, in, in today's forum, and I appreciate it. I was going to ask uh, Ms. Ferentinos, you mentioned that point. Give me, if you could, give me a couple of examples. I mentioned site-specific that have direct relationship to to the community and what significance I mentioned three sites there's certainly others but you also said that it's important to integrate the community's experience and history into the overall telling can you give some examples they don't have to be site specific but if they are that's fine too well it's actually a little tricky to be talking about the LGBTQ past using that phrase because, of course, those words that go into that acronym are uh, words that are relatively recent in the nation's history. But if we're thinking about the history of same-sex attachments, love, and desire, and of people who um, had varied gender expressions and challenged the confines of their particular gender role. Then the, the American past opens up and there are myriad examples. Okay. Got it now. I could go on, but- No, no, please. No, I, <laughs> I, 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 I caught on where you were going. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Like Eleanor Roosevelt and mm -hmm. yes. some famous civil rights leaders you know, who that part of their identity was just completely ignored in telling their histories and their important roles in our history. The role of the frontier West as a place where people that were uh, feeling constrained by the moral standards and norms of the settled United States um, moving westward. They were not always in nuclear family groups. Many people were escaping uh, their, their, the gender that had been assigned to them or the moral prescriptions that they marry a member of the opposite sex. And um, when we look, when we use an LGBTQ perspective to look at that standard story of the American past, worlds open up and it frees the the education historical education from this very uh, heteronormative it's all about the nuclear form family and people who behaved and stayed in line with moral standards it tells such a richer story thank you mr lord uh July, I, th I think National Park Service theme for July is 
telling all American stories. And uh, as a touchstone and a goal, uh, any, ref any comments, any reflections on that theme and how we can uh, make it more real? I think it's an important theme and I'm, I'm glad that it's one that's being, it's being pursued by the National Park Service. Uh, you know, it is, it is important as we, I think we've conveyed today that not only are we celebrating our civil rights heroes and her heroes and heroines at places like Stonewall, but also exploring the richer history of, Amer of America and looking for those doctors and those nurses and those teachers who also play a role in in, uh, in the nation's development um, and success. Um, and so I, I, I just wanna just thank the National Park Service for taking on that task an, a couple of years ago when they published an enormous theme study. It's over a thousand pages long, multiple chapters that go into great detail um, all sorts of different aspects of LGBTQ history and how to, how to interpret it and help cities and counties and states and historic preservation officers and others think about how to build in a more inclusive um, history as they as they tell it um, in their in their in their regions and in their communities it's one of a number of theme studies that the National Park Service has undertaken and completed that um, I think every American sh should look at because it is I think a, a testament to their um, focus on trying to ensure that when the American public is going to our public lands that they are beginning to see these, these stories be told. It takes resources and it takes time and it takes research for the Park Service to actually do this work. Um, and so we would continue to um, ask everyone to join us in supporting the National Park Service and getting, getting those resources in order to to interpret that history and then create the materials that um, and the education programming that the rangers use um, when they're talking to families like mine. Um, when we, if we go to Val Kill, you know, in Eleanor Roosevelt's home in New York and hear the story about the lesbians that were her friends and how much of a role they played in her life. Or if we go to the American West, perhaps there are stories that can be told if we go to Alcatraz to hear about prisoner number one, who I believe was a gay man. Um, stories that can be told and reinterpreted um, through new eyes and through new, through new lenses. And so I think the opportunity to have a month where its focus is on inclusion is, is, is great and we would encourage it to be repeated. And that study had a great deal of depth to it, which I appreciate. It wasn't about surface issues. How do we do it, do something for a week? It had some serious depth to it and that was very good. Thank you for bringing that up. Yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Grijalva. I will recognize um, Congresswoman Davids. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, well, I appreciate the opportunity to um, sit in with, uh, with my colleagues today. Uh, one of the things that I think uh, so many of us that came in um, to Congress just recently have really uh, highlighted and, and tried to talk a lot about are all the new voices at the table um, that haven't been here before and how that changes conversations. And um, one of the things um, that uh, in your testimony, uh, Elise, I, um, I picked up on was the, the sometimes well-intended programs and initiatives that have unintended consequences, sometimes of uh, marginalizing or um, making an experience invisible. And I'm curious from um, all the folks here, if you could talk a little bit about uh, places so that in the future, as we're building out new programs, as we're thinking about ways that um, you know, we can we can make a difference in our legislating. What are s what are some of the unintended um, consequences that you um, might have seen in the past? And you know, I mean, I think uh, right off the bat, I can think of ways that you know, what is the history of this place? The sharing of that history that leaves out so many people is. Uh, Sure, the intention of sharing history is a, a noble one, but when you leave a whole bunch of people out, 
it's not necessarily positive. So if you could maybe just touch on one or two things, if you have something to share around that. So one of the many hats that I'm currently wearing in my professional life is as a partner with a consulting firm in the industry um, called the Avarna Group. And our focus is on social and environmental sustainability in, in the outdoor industry. Um, and to date, we've worked with something like 120 different clients across all facets of the industry in, in helping them to uncover their unconscious biases. Um, so we often get categorized as like diversity trainers. Um, and I know that bias and unconscious bias is sort of, a, those are hot topics or hot buzzwords right now. Um, but what we've been able to see through that work is the critical importance of spending the, the time and allocating resources towards actually doing that work well, right? And figuring out what, uh, what those sort of topics mean to us on an individual level. Um, if we do not understand who we are and our privileges and our blind spots, it's really difficult to do this work well. And I think that's when you run into those well-intended situations with impacts that can be quite the opposite. Um, so it, helping to provide or influence towards uh, the, the allocation of resources for different groups and opportunities to be able to get that sort of training. I think um, one of my fellow panelists called it cultural competency training. Um, so putting an emphasis around that work, I feel like is critical. Um, like I mentioned, I've been in the industry for about 15 years and I've seen folks uh, just consistently, you know, be beating their heads against the wall and continuing to come up short as it relates to equity broadly. And it's often because we are not taking that initial step to figure out who we are and individuals make up institutions and a collection of institutions make up an industry. So if you don't start with that individual level work, um, it just makes the rest of that process extremely difficult. And I just reiterate what I said earlier regarding my family's travels to national parks. You know, before 2016, there just was nothing, there was no national park unit that spoke to my family. I mean, it was, there was no LGBTQ unit that was designated specifically for LGBTQ history. And that absence became much more apparent, you know, as we had a daughter and we're looking for ways to make sure that she would grow up in a society that um, saw her family being valued and respected. The other thing too is you go, we, we go to a lot of places and there's I'm certain stories that are being left untold at park sites across the country that we've already visited that I feel like uh, you know we probably lost out on some really interesting people or learning about some really interesting people um, that we just don't talk about that are intentionally or unintentionally being overlooked um, for, for whatever reason and I think having a focus now on trying to retell you know traditional American tales through the lenses, uh, through the lens of different Americans, I think will just really enrich and deepen our understanding of each of us as a people and all of us as a community of, and as a nation. So we just, I think, we just highlight the need to really have that as a priority and a value for, the, for our public lands going forward. I think that one of the very basic steps that could be done is to have the staff that work um, with visitors at public lands to interrogate a bit about what they assume gender is, what they assume families are. Because the subtle messages um, both in interacting with guests and in the stories that are told there are glaring when you don't fit into those assumptions. In addition to transgender people, members of our community are genderqueer. They don't fit firmly or identify firmly with either gender. So when they're on a tour, of a historic house. And just in an effort to bond with the visitors, a ranger says, oh, and you know how women are. They loved to shop, so they decorated this house. Something like that. That is telling someone who doesn't reside in that gender stereotype that they're not part of the conversation. Likewise, how many times has someone seen my wedding ring and asked if my husband will be joining me today? And really subtle things that would go unnoticed for people that are confident in their welcome at a public site 
can strike really hard for people who are assuming they're not welcome until proven otherwise. Yeah, those are, those are, I mean, straight people don't think about those things, right? How every time that's, that you're put in a situation of, oh, do I come out, do I not come out? Because you don't just come out once, you know? Um, but I, I love the idea, and I, I took a look at the theme study uh, before this panel, and I, they, they did say, and I didn't look through all of them, that there have also been 10 historic sites designated, not monuments, but historic sites that are LGBTQ. But one of the things they didn't do that I think is so interesting that's been brought up on this panel is looking at where is the history already being told that we should be a part of, right? So, for example, the Cesar Chavez Monument. Most people in this country don't know he was the first civil rights leader to come out and speak publicly in support of LGBT people, right? That should be part of the story that gets told at the monument. Um, so I, I don't know that under this administration we as expect them to, like, go back and <laughs> and take a look at that, but the we know that it can be done by looking at things like that theme study and the effort that was put into that. But just things like, you know, how to, seeing those flags up there, you know, the signal that we're welcome here can be done in very small ways. I appreciate that. Um, one really quick question, and then I'll, and then I'll be done, I promise, um, is, uh, uh, Chad, sorry, I keep using everybody's first names. Hopefully that's not offensive <laughs> to anybody. Um, Laura. Uh, I just, out of curiosity, because we've spoken a lot and heard a lot about historical contexts, but um, recognizing that we're all operating here in the present moment. Um, when you go, and this demonstrates my uh, ignorance around spending much time in public parks, but, um, you know, I think there probably are, like, family uh, packages or when you go to things, people as make assumptions about families. And um, on the materials and that sort of thing, does it uh, indicate something that looks more like a nuclear or, you know, quote-unquote nuclear family, man, woman, 2.5 children or um, something like that? Does that make sense? It does, and I would, I mean, I do, I do agree with, with Susan's um, description of rangers when they are presenting um, programs, because mm -hmm. there are assumptions that are made, and there are assumptions that are made that do feel e exclusive when I'm standing there with my husband and daughter, and I'm, I don't necessarily feel like the ranger is looking at us like a family. They're looking at us like this is my friend, and I just happen to be with this small child. Um, and I think from that perspective, that's more where I feel being on the outside looking in oftentimes when I'm participating in a, in a ranger-led program at a national park site or some other public lands. In terms of the material and the imagery that gets depicted, um, you know, much of that is, you know, if it's a historic site, it's historical imagery that isn't necessarily going to kind of be marketing material that's going to try and demonstrate kind of familial issues, at least in my experience. Um, so it's mostly historic, um, but even there, it's it is you know there may be some historic material that should get depicted. Um, there, sh and then as you're reading the signage in historic in visitor centers, I haven't been to Cesar Chavez yet, but I mean, it'd be great to go and like actually see that in the signage and like see that representation. And that's the kind of thing that I'm I'm looking for as I'm going to or bringing my daughter to these places um, to ensure that she can see you know, all aspects of our family as they're going to places that you wouldn't even think would have an LGBTQ connection um, for whatever stereotype I may be carrying, um, um, but do. And so having that research done and that interpretation provided uh, for, for the American public um, when they're going to these places, I think is, is very, very important. Well, thank you so much for your time and for being here today. I yield back. Thank you so much, and um, the chair recognizes Mr. Soto. Thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, apologize for being late. Man, there's so much going on today. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I think about the LGBTQ civil rights movement, how long it's been going on and how we've seen such great strides lately while still so long to go, and even facing some setbacks nowadays that we have to fight. Uh, you all are reminding me 
through saying different variations of this phrase over and over, that there are stories to be told, that there are stories left untold. Uh, and I think that's one of the main reasons why we're here today. There are landmarks uh, to be preserved. There's perspectives to be respected. And uh, there are threats to these things. Uh, there's even a lack of understanding that there needs to have this happen by a lot of our colleagues. Uh, I want to focus particularly on the landmark preservation aspect of it, uh, something near and dear to our district and to Central Florida, and also one of the many policies that come under the jurisdiction of the Natural Resources Committee. Um, we see it done right with places like Stonewall Inn in New York City. We even had an apology by the police commissioner uh, for that incident. And then we've seen travesty uh, with uh, the Matthew Shepard shrine that uh, came about in Wyoming and then uh, was removed, the, the, the fence post and, and so many well wishes that were there. Um, and now we've just filed our bill uh, to create a Pulse National Memorial. Uh, which has uh, strong support in the region, and it is based out of a recognition of not only the terrible horror that happened there, but how our community came together. And it's also a recognition that these landmarks are under threat, uh, and that we need laws to protect them. Uh, so I want to give two questions. You all can answer either both or just one of them uh, for the panel. Uh, my first question is, if you would like to list uh, one or more LGBTQ sites that may need protection uh, and or any legislation you'd like to propose to protect these sites from destruction like what we have with the Antiquities Act for, uh, for certain sites uh, that have uh, an antiquity nature to them. And we'll start uh, from right to left. Oh, you're right. <laughs> yes, for my right. Um, <clears throat> one, of the, one of the sites that I would suggest are a couple of areas that are near um, Gosh, Klondike right. uh, Gold Rush Historical Park in downtown Seattle in Pioneer Square. Um, I was actually just able the other week to accompany Representative Jayapal on a walking tour. Um, there's a, a student at, grad student at the University of Washington who's done a tremendous amount of research in the queer history of downtown Seattle and has developed a fantastic 45 minute or so walking tour and there are a number of sites um, that are due to the ex rapid expansion courtesy of Amazon uh, that's happening in Seattle that are either slated for demolition um, or are, are very close to, to being so. And there's sites that um, you know, represent like the first openly gay bar in Seattle and, and other such things. Um, and they are, like I said, in close proximity to an existing park. Um, so there are a number of places like that in, in our area local to us up in Seattle that I would absolutely suggest for protection and preservation. Thank you. And I think I'm going to focus a little bit more universally and just urge the committee and all members to really support the National Park Service and its day-to-day -day work um, in areas like its, uh, in its operations of the National Registry of Historic Places, its work uh, with the National Landmark Program, um, its grants to help uh, communities with underrepresented sites. Um, supporting that work um, in addition to helping it address the backlog of interpretation and updates that are needed across the country I think would be time very well spent. And I think there is plenty of work to be done at places that are already existing as we continue uh, community dialogue about where some of the next sites should be um, after we, uh, now that we've designated the first one at the, st um, the Stonewall National Monument. I think um, we would definitely um, love to continue to work with all members to really focus on lifting up and, um, uh, and supporting the activities of the National Park Service and the other public lands unit, uh, unit uh, other public lands um, to continue to try and integrate um, these stories. Um. Well, you rightly uh, make a very important point that uh, is involved with the preservation of LGBTQ history. And that is that this is a traditionally marginalized community and so the sites connected to that history 
are um, at great danger of being destroyed. And in fact, the number of LGBTQ relevant sites that have already been lost because it wasn't until quite recently that anyone was even considering LGBTQ associations as being part of American history um, is heartbreaking. But ra also, rather than specific sites, I would highlight that there are parts of this country, and I am very specifically thinking of San Francisco, all that, though that is not the only one, that are undergoing such extreme development now that all historic, <laughs> so many of the stories of the American past that are associated with places are being destroyed because development is happening quicker than we can actually assess what are the sites worth preserving. Um, and that is for, particularly for San Francisco, that is the home for so much of this community's history that is a pretty dire situation. I'd also just like to encourage the committee to think beyond the coasts, to think beyond the 20th century, and to think beyond the realm of political activism when thinking about historic significance. Those are all vital, very important parts of the story, but I, reside in Indiana. There's a vibrant LGBTQ history in the Midwest as well as in the urban centers. And there's a vibrant history that stretches back to before the European settlement of this country. And so to think more holistically, I think can to some extent separate the current political situation related to LGBTQ people than from the fact that LGBTQ people are citizens of this country and have contributed to all facets of the development of this country. Well, I, I think thinking beyond the coast is definitely important, but being from the West Coast, uh, the, I, I love Chairman Grijalva that you mentioned the black cat. Um, I mean, that was just such an important uh, uh, piece of um, a, a seminal point for activism uh, in Los Angeles um, and in the LGBT movement. Um, I don't know if this is feasible, um, Representative Soto, but in, it, when thinking about when these designations come about, and thank you so much for the bill on Pulse and the memorial at Pulse, but as these, as these kinds of resolutions or designations come about, I, is, I don't know if it's feasible to have language in there that requires that all aspects of that site's history and those participants are, need to be included, right? It's challenging because some of that, so much of that comes from the local level and those people have a very clear perspective on whose history they want to tell. Um, but without requiring it, I don't know how, you know, they say, what is, what's that saying? History is written by the winners, you know? So the people that get left out, if we don't require their stories to be told, then it's only gonna be if somebody feels like it. Well, thank God we're sitting in the United States Congress right now uh, in ability to be able to have some of those wins. And everybody in this room is a winner, so thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Soto. I just have one question, and so I think whoever wants to answer it can. Uh, but first, I'm going to just tell a quick story because I feel compelled. Um, my, I, I'm I'm a single mom to a queer daughter, and I found out from someone else that she was gay. So we got home that night after I got off work and I was like, why didn't you tell me you were gay? And she said, why should I have to tell you I'm gay? Do teenagers sit their parents down and tell them they're heterosexual? And I said, probably not. <laughs> and uh, of course, by then I'm like, I'm so sorry. I didn't, you know, I didn't mean to offend you. <laughs> kind of, you know, that's how I kind of felt. But I, I, it makes me feel like She's right because we should all just accept each other the way we are 
and of course love your children regardless of however you know whatever they do or however they decide you know however their the path of their life takes them that you just love them as much as you can and so i just i just thought i would share that with you thank you she's a lucky kid <laughs> if she ever thank wants you. to go well, on an OTA I think trip she is too she um, and you know she it, it, I I grew up when people had these bumper stickers that said uh, money isn't everything but it keeps the kids in touch so <laughs> 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 she's lucky I have a steady job now because before I was living paycheck to paycheck it was very iffy. <laughs> um. <laughs> well, she just got an invitation. Oh yeah, if she ever wants to come on an OTA trip, you just I'm gonna make know. her go. Yeah, there you go. I'm still her mom. I'm, s I'm still her mom, and she spent, you know, my dad raised me outdoors. I just, I mean, that was it. We, that's what we did every vacation. His idea of a vacation was rowing up and down a swamp <laughs> and fishing for eels. So I, I just appreciate every single time I have to spend outdoors, and I think, I just feel like everybody should have that experience. Every single American should be able to enjoy that in their life. So real quick, I'll just ask, um, LGBTQ Americans served in all of our wars from the revolution to the war on terror, even before President Eisenhower's executive order in 1953 banning LGBTQ Americans from federal service, societal, societal norms forced LGBTQ service members to hide their true selves. This administration has made it clear that it wants to return to those times. Can you tell us what it would mean to LGBTQ Americans to see themselves reflected in memorials to our nation's veterans, recognizing that the law prevents changes to existing monuments? And maybe I'll ask Chad Lord to answer that first. Um, it would mean a lot to me, and I, uh, Primarily because I remember when I was growing up, um, I grew up in southwest Minnesota. Um, you know, we, you know, we just didn't come across any images or interpretation. I think you know, I'm, you know, it would it would just be really great to see kind of the full integration of every type of soldier um, be represented in the memorials that have been established to um, remind us of the sacrifices that um, these heroes and heroines have, have done for our country. We should talk more about that. Well, and I would say in addition to what it would mean for LGBT people, normalizing the fact that we are here, that we do all these things that we always have you know, that's not just a benefit for us. It helps to change the perception of us in the country, and I think that's really important. Anyone, el anyone else like to weigh in on that? No. I'm so grateful. Thank you all so much for taking time out of your, I know what it's like to get around DC during the day, <laughs> bumper to bumper usually. Um, but we're so grateful that you came to uh, share your stories and your insight, and, um, and we will absolutely be in touch and just make sure that you stay in contact with us and help us, you know, give us your ideas and help us to uh, make some positive changes in this country so that every American can partake in it. We're counting on you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Forums adjourned. Great job. Can you, can you guys? <laughs> What's that? There's more sun than I expected. <laughs> we need somebody to come take our picture. Thank you, Jess. Here, let me. Thank you. Yes, you know how to make me look. Probably Younger and uh, thinner. Social media, although they were, I think they were probably. Yeah, yeah they did live stream. Good. Do you want to scoot in? <laughs> Thank you, Jess. Thank you. Do you want to get one up there? That's so. Yeah, yeah that's very cool. <laughs> Oh, yeah.
Yes, thank you. Oh, thanks. I know I'm all like. <laughs>